Hey guys, Chris here. Today we have a story from one of our viewers who, when she was 11 years old, was at her grandparents' farm in the Missouri Ozarks and she had a face-to-face -face encounter with something she called her shadow. Also, we are camping tonight and I'm going to be cooking my classic base camp burger. That's next. Okay, so I am at Grover Hot Springs State Park in the Sierra Nevada. They got a really nice hot springs over here. And we're high in the Sierra here. And I'm gonna set up camp. I'm gonna go for a hike up some amazing waterfalls. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna play this interview with one of our viewers. Her name is Sheila. So Sheila contacted me recently and wanted to tell me her story about when she was 11 years old in 1970 at her grandparents' farm in Missouri in remote Miller County. And Miller County has currently 24,000 people living there. And back in 1970, there were substantially less people then. And through Miller County flows the Osage River flowing from east to west, and it flows into the Lake of the Ozarks, this beautiful, huge reservoir in the middle of the Ozarks with 1,150 miles of shoreline. Just amazing, beautiful country, great for boating, canoeing, there's a few lodges on it, camping. In Miller County, where this farm was, there's a lot of history with this farm with Sheila's grandparents and her family and her cousins and her memories of visiting this farm when she was a kid, running through the hollers with her cousins, that's what she called them, hollers, during the summer and her visits up there. And this is where she had this encounter with what she calls her shadow. And the reason she called it her shadow was because She's felt it's watched her before. In fact, she's felt it's possibly watched her many times before. When she would go out by herself into the woods and just hang out by the creek, sitting on her favorite log, going for hikes by herself, or even being with her cousins. And because of this, she felt, and this is her words, she felt she was chosen. This is her story. Hello. Hi, is this Sheila? It is. Hi, Chris. Hi, Sheila. Is this a good time for you? It is. Okay. Our storms yeah. have our storms have moved through. We probably got a few more coming, but they're not going to be like they were. Yeah, and you're in Iowa, is that correct? I am. We had tornadoes on the ground all over here today. So. Wow. Yeah. I used to live in Minnesota, <laughs> so we're we were neighbors. You know? <laughs> up just north of you there. <laughs> yeah, tornadoes. Uh, my my ex wife went to a high school. Their mascot was called the Tornadoes because they were oh. kind of famous for tornadoes. Imagine going. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's I'm well, kind of familiar with them, but uh, yeah, they're they're they can be scary. They're they're very random, unlike a hurricane, which is like a major event that it's coming, and it's going to well, take over half the a, state. There was a supercell came through today, and those are the ones that you know they could just. They they just pop up and and yeah. stuff, so they make it a little bit more hard to predict until. But there were storm chasers that 
I follow. And so I could see the live feed and see when they touched down. And But I'm so glad you're recording this because um, this is going to be the first time in a long time that I have, um, you know, recounted all this. So I'm glad you're going to be able to make sense okay. out of everything. So thank you, Sheila, for coming on our, our show here. Tell us what uh, what happened. Where did this start? My grandparents lived down in Iberia, Missouri, which was down in the heart of the Ozarks there in Missouri. And my mom was one of 12 children, and we spent a lot of time down there. We were probably down there running those hills at least five times a year for, you know, a week, two weeks, or, you know, whatnot. And this just happened to be in 1970, and it would have been toward the end of summer, and my grandfather was sick. And my mom being one of 12, my grandfather was older. And so the hospital he was in was in Jefferson City, which is 50 miles away. Mm -hmm. So we left early that morning from Davenport, Iowa, which is over 300 and some miles away. And at that time, um, you had the two-lane highways. So today it might take you five hours, but it was about an eight-hour trip then. And halfway down, we'd stop in Hanoma, Missouri, get something to eat, gas back up, and then get on the road. So when we got down there, of course, my mom and dad took my grandmother and my uncle, who always lived at home, um, they took off and left to go to Jefferson City. So my two, my younger brother and sister, um, they went in and lay down to take a nap. I don't know if you were able to look at what I sent you about my grandmother. Um, but I anyway. saw her name, and I did see a link or anything, so I wasn't sure how to really follow up on it. Well, it, down there, your your nearest neighbor is, is miles and miles away. Hmm. And when you get down off the highways and you come in onto the, you could call it gravel, but it's actually Flint Rock, so when you're going to come down into my grandparents, you know, we always got excited because as soon as we hit that flint rock, we knew we'd wind on down in and then we'd be at our grandparents. And you get up to a cow guard. So once you go through that cow guard, you're going to start winding down into these hollers and you mm. come down about a, um, a little ways and there's a cabin off to your left where they built because you have all these people coming in and we'd all usually stay over there because we'd stay up late and tell stories and be goofy. And then as you wind back around, you come to your left and right in there, um, there starts, there's a corral. So there's kind of a clearing coming out of the trees. Well, two horses were there and then there, they used to have um, pigs, but they just had a couple of sows and they were at a pen right there. Then you curve around and you cross the creek and off to your right from there is the smokehouse. Then you you got the creeks wind all around in that area. Got it. Is there, is there so, a property, a farm? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so you're down in deep into and you've got hollers, if you know what a yeah. holler is, um, yep. all throughout there. And, you know, um, the the creek just runs all around that property. If you're facing there and you've got the house behind you and you've got the gate there and you're standing at that gate and you're looking opposite the house, off to your left a little bit, you're going to see that cabin up on the hill. And across that creek bed, across from there, you've got a spring over in that area because that's going to come into play here. And then sure. you'll have the hollers that go up behind those places. We, the, my brother and sister, go into sleep. My sister and I decide we're going to walk down to this corral. So we're walking from the house, and we're going back north. We cross the creek there and go over. And we don't want anything to do with those, you know, the sows because they're mean anyway. And we're over, and we're petting. Jim, was, he was a big old Belgian horse. He was their plow horse. Sure. And then Tr Trigger was a Palomino, and he was just a mean horse I think they kept around for Jim as company. We were sitting there petting him. But on the way down, as we're walking, we even commented that it had gotten quiet. And that's very strange when you're in a forest and you're down, you know, you got that all around you and you got all these bluffs and hollers and there's always sound. 
And the Shep the dog was literally trying to walk in between our legs. It was just weird. So we get down there, and we're petting the horses, and Sharon's view was blocked by Jim. And um, I notice that there's movement coming out of those trees right there into the clearing. And your brain's thinking, this is weird. Why would they come down through there? And I didn't hear a car because you always hear the cars coming on that flint rock. And you're thinking, why would they come that way? And then I realized this isn't a person I'm seeing. And it's brown with a reddish hue to it. And the arms are longer than a person's. And at that point, from where I was distance from it at that point, it looked like fur to me. Because I've seen it more than once. I'm seeing this, and my mind's trying to make sense of it. And about that time, it must have become aware of us. I don't know if the horses were acting weird. Stood up erect and took off and fast. And so it would have went down, went over that fence, and probably over that part of the, the creek and up that bluff is what I'm thinking. And so anyway, but it took off. And so I'm trying to tell my sister what I've seen. And I'm really yeah. confused by her reaction because she's telling me, oh, it's probably something in your eyes. You're tired, blah, 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 <laughs> blah, blah, you know. And um, I'm, I am like, no. So then I start thinking, my brother and sister are in the house alone. Now, you got to remember, there's, we're four kids, 16 and under, down in these hollers by ourselves. And the nearest house is miles away. Our yeah. parents and their grandma and uncle are in Jefferson, you know. So, um, and this would have been because we didn't get down there until probably one o'clock in the afternoon. So by the time we start heading back toward the house, it's like three, four o'clock. And the um, I'm moving a little bit faster because I want to go in and see that my brother and sister are okay. And they are. So we go back outside. So when we go outside around the house, there's fencing because you're trying to keep the, you know stuff out from around the house and because there's cows and there's chickens my sister at that time I don't know in the picture if they put the other gate on but there was a lower gate and you could hang over it and a lot of times I think the reason they changed it is because the kids would lean over it and swing it and so that's what she was doing and so I was in baseball and so I'm picking up rocks and I'm throwing over and hitting that spring because they have a board across it that keeps stuff from getting in it and I'm doing that and I was probably doing that 15 20 minutes and Sharon had stopped swinging she's just hanging over the gate I lean down to get another rock or something and I come up and it's right there what's right there now the Bigfoot he is between five to within five to ten feet of me I'm frozen and I'm standing there and it when I'm it's looking me up and down it's probably between six four six six it would come back up and then squint its eyes and like it was boring looking into me and look into my eyes and then it would look at me again and I don't know how long it went on, to be honest with you. It felt like forever. But I realized that it wasn't fur. It was hair. Its eyes were light, like a dark brown with a reddish hue to it. I've heard others um, describe it as a cinnamon color, and it was kind of like that. So my sister started moving behind me again, and it was off again. And it took off down behind where the planting field and that, hollered on down to the creek. It was gone that fast again. I oh. didn't say a word. And Chris, I don't remember going in the house. I don't remember if I ate. I don't, I, I, I had to be in shock is what yeah. I would think that it was because I don't remember, have no memory of any of that. Well, I didn't say a word to my sister. It's dark down there, and in, in hollers, it gets pitch black. Yeah, Even on a moonlit sure. night, it's dark. 
So we're down there, and, and I've got all these relatives and people, you know, they're going to be coming in, but there's nobody coming. So we go upstairs, and there's no locks on my grandparents, you know, their porch or anything like that. So we're upstairs, and I just keep going to the windows, <laughs> looking out. And the window that is where the bed that we were supposed to be in that night, because of the fact that we got down there and people are coming in, we didn't go over to the cabin that night. And we were there by ourselves. And so there's that bluff right behind that window. And I just felt like everything was looking at me. My sister kept telling me, would you stop? Just sit down. Well, then I heard a car. I heard a vehicle on that Flint Rock. That's yeah. when my panic set in. Because I realized, oh, they're going to have to get out of their car. It's dark. And they got to get in here. Now, Later on, as I got older, I realized I didn't feel threatened. But right then, I, whatever I was feeling, I was in, in panic mode. They got in the house and everything. I still told nobody. I literally made myself sick that night hearing people and the cars coming and making sure people got in and hearing them talk when they, they came in through the night and everything. I didn't tell anybody until a year later. I mean, how, how do you do that? My sister didn't believe me. I just, it, it was just a, I just can't even explain, but I, I we were all at the cabin, and you got to imagine this cabin. It's wall-to-wall -wall beds and wood-burning stove, and my family was a whole lot of fun. So people were talking about things, and I finally told everyone. And so there were the ones that were like, oh, okay, ones who believed me. But my Uncle Byron... He pulled me aside and said, he, he told me, I've seen things. I believe you. My grandmother pulled me aside when she heard how I was being teased by some of my cousins. And she told me. Now, when you get on the site, my grandmother wrote for the autogram. And her articles are in a museum down there. She wrote about it in her article. I was talking to um, a cousin of mine here recently, and I actually talked to him today to check on him in storms. He's got the article. My uncle seen it standing out. So others had seen what I seen. But I realized as, as time went on that it had always been there. That's why I call him my shadow. I don't mm. know if the one I seen at the corral or the one I seen that when I came up and it was right there were the same ones. I don't know. But I realized there was a tree that had fallen had fallen across the, the creek there and I would go down there and just to get away from all my cousins or whatever, lay there listening to the creek and um, different things um, that way. And I realized there were other times when it had went silent and I felt like somebody was there and I would look to see if it was my, you know, cousins coming to bug me or, you know, different things. But um, I didn't go back to my tree that year the the you know the next year but i went back after and i always hoped that it would just you know come again others had seen it when my uncle seen it my uncle wayne that lived there at home um he seen it in 78 and my grandmother wrote about it so you're talking from 1970 to 78 you know then she wrote about it yeah did she have did you have the article that she wrote about my cousin has it. He has it. And okay. um, he lives about... Do you, do, you, do you know the story of that? I mean, what's that story? Like, in a nutshell, um, not like, not you know, but just essentially what happened with, with her story. Well, he went out to feed the chickens and do some stuff like that. And he went out and it was standing by the, the fence area there, um, out, you know, the, okay. the fence that went around the yard. It was standing there. And he uh -huh. seen its eyes. He described its eyes different. He went back in and he was acting weird because he, he had issues. He had um, oxygen had been kept from him. You know, you're talking back in the 20s being born. She said, what's wrong? And he told her what he had seen. And she wrote about it. Anyway, so thank you. This felt good. Okay, this yeah. feels liberating. You no, know, I've had many people say that just, just to write it down, just to talk about it and not be judged about it. So I have a, just a few questions. Is that a few yes. questions? Yes. So when you were throwing the rocks, I'm trying to get the picture in my mind, and you're just a kid. You're like 11 years old, 
Yes. They're throwing rocks like kids throw rocks for fun, right? Just... Well, I was in baseball, and I was a serious, okay. you know, Got it. it was like my, I think, second or third year baseball, so I was tossing them over there just practicing. I was going to yes. be, this would have been probably end of July, somewhere in there, and I was going to be 12 in mm-hmm. September that year. Got it. So, yeah. so you were throwing rocks, and then did you look down to get another rock, and then you looked up and you saw it? Or, yes. or how did it appear? Yes. I squatted down to, because uh, there were certain rocks I wanted. So I was looking for something that had a, you know some weight to it so I could toss it over there and hear it. Then I know how far I was throwing. And when I come, I come back up, and I started to bring my arm up, and it was right there. Well, you know, many, it, it, it was so close. No, it was between five to ten. But it was very close. It was not, yeah, I, I would say it was probably about five to seven feet at the very most. Of course. Yeah. And when it was standing there, was it moving? Was it swaying? Was it? Just standing. And when I came up, it was it was looking me up and down. So it was like mm-hmm. probably about at my legs area. And then it come up and it, it squinted its eyes and looked in my eyes. I mean, wow. intensely. And then, I'm sorry, I'm getting loud because it's, <laughs> it's bringing up a lot of things. But anyway, it... Um, then it would look at me again, and it was like it was checking out. It didn't move. It, yeah. ju- it just was its eyes going wow. up and down, and then would come back. I remember it looking in my eyes at least three times. Now, however long that was, I don't know. Can you describe the face, the nose, the mouth? The, the shape of the head was different than a man's. It wasn't round like a man's skull would be. Yeah. It did appear to be kind of more oblong. The face wasn't completely covered in hair. It was like on its cheeks and patches. The nose, I, I don't, I don't want to say it was a gorilla nose, but it wasn't. It didn't look like a human. It was um, flatter. Yeah, it it didn't, but it wasn't a gorilla nose because it didn't have them big nostrils, but it wasn't, mm-hmm. you know, that way. But yeah. I don't remember what the lips look like, to be honest okay. with you, because of it sure. staring in my eyes, mesmerized or whatever mm-hmm. was going on in shock because, it, you know, I was just watching it, its eyes move up and down and then come back at me. Was it muscular? Hand, very. Okay. But many of them are very bulky and very um, like a trim waist, and then a big chest and shoulders. Yes. And then, um, and then yes. Arms, powerful looking arms, with, like um, long arms. It would be like what I would um, describe as thick. You know, mm. not fat or anything, but solid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that um, a solid. You knew it was solid. And for something to be that size and move without sound and move as quick as they do is just unreal. But, yes, the arms. Now, I don't remember really looking at that. I, you know, I got a haze of what the whole body looked like. Um, But when I seen it the first time, that was one of the things I first realized that the arms were longer than a man's. Does he pivot and start running, or or how does he leave? Yeah, it was it it was like he was on air. So pivot okay. would be a good word because, um, and gone, just take and off. Gone. And he went to yeah. the woods, or where did he go? Yeah, did well, he... if okay. if you when you're standing there at the house. There's the little part of the creek that goes around that fence line and and up toward the um, barn shed where the horses go. But across that is another, you got the hen house over there, and then you got a fence line that goes around, and that whole giant field is where they plant and farm. And so around that, you're going to, that creek that I've just been talking about goes up that way, and then that goes into another holler, and that's the direction he ran. But okay. there's another holler then that goes up to see behind that cabin. You know, it's imprinted on me 
it, what I seen and what happened that day, it changes who you are and that, but I'd give anything if, if I just, yeah, you just wished you would have reached out or something, but you don't know what might have happened. But no, anyway, very, very unpredictable. You've never experienced anything like no. that. You're 11 years no. old. Yeah. The parents aren't there and you're no. like, Oh, do I run? Do I, you know, no, you know, I had no thought process freeze. in my head. Yeah, <laughs> I can't and, even remember and, what my thought process was. My memory starts coming back to me going up the stairs to go upstairs and then, like I said, when I heard that car, it was like a joyous feeling, <gasps> you know, somebody's coming. But then the panic set in because I realized yeah. they had to get from the car to the house. And sure, it was like everything. That, that, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you understood the potential danger of something that large and powerful. Clearly, you saw oh, it. Yeah. And now it's out there somewhere. And now it's nighttime. Yeah. Right? Yes. And you're like, yes, it and be it's behind pitch the black. bushes right next to the door or something. I don't yes. know. <laughs> well, and the other thing was, Chris, is you're yeah. asking me about that. You could feel the power of mm. this being. Um, How so? The presence of it, that you just could, it was like there was a, a, I don't know how to describe it, but you just could feel that it took up the space, yeah. that there was a, a, this being was um, enormous being standing there, wow. and and, and the yeah. presence is a great is a really good word for that from from the people I've talked to and, and obviously your experience and and this one you said is about six and a half feet. These things can get seven, eight, nine, even I, ten feet yeah. tall. Could you imagine three, four feet taller? <laughs> wow. No. <laughs> no, um, I, you know, the thing is, is that I know that standing there and you come up like that, um, you know, when you have time to think about the whole experience, you realize you're looking up and sure. all of that and the whole, and, and like I said, I realized I didn't feel threatened by it. After you know, after you have time to think about it, as time goes on, he was very curious yeah. about me. That was for sure. Very. And you're the one that sounds like you spent time out there by the creek and the log and yes. looking at the horses and just you know enjoying being out there. And, and well, my cousins were hooligans, the boys and stuff. <laughs> you know, they're running those hills, being nuts and crazy and stuff like that. So it probably didn't want nothing to do with them. But, yeah. you know, I just think about all the times my grandmother, now my uncle passed away in 82. So for two years before she died, she lived down in there by herself. Yeah. Can wow. you imagine that? Oh, my god. my uncle passed away in 77. I mean, my grandpa oh, passed away in 77. I, I really hope that you can go and you put in Charlotte Huddleston Beard and it'll say Miller County. Okay. That that um, I put on there, and I hope you can go see because you're going to see how that creek runs, and it's going to give you an idea around the property there, and it it tells um, some history, and um, there's some you know stuff on there, but it 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 still boggles my mind that this happened to me. To be honest with you, you're not the only one, and that's <laughs> what I'm <laughs> discovering because this is you know relatively new for me. I've been doing this for about two years. Uh, stories and then talking to people like yourself, but this is not something I've been doing for 20 years or anything. And so I'm, I'm but I'm learning there's a lot of similarities between uh, people like, you know, with you and other people. And well, when I seen the one you did down in the Ozarks, like, okay, I've got to talk to him. And, but I got to tell you about this. I got to tell you. And okay. in um, 2017, my uncle Marvin passed away. You know, and he lived down there. Now I got some cousins that lived down on the property down the way, and had to talk about them. Um, but every my last aunt passed away, um, the last one of the children a year ago this month. So all the kids are gone. But we went down for the funeral would have been in June of 2017, and that would have been my cousin Marty that I was just talking to, and his brother Monty's dad, my mom's brother. And my mom had passed away the year before. But anyway, so we go. We got a family cemetery. 
And just down from the family cemetery, you have to drive over to this, the swimming hole there on Bear Creek, but it's a great big swimming hole. So we would all get in my uncle's truck. He'd take us over there and dump us off, and we'd go in this big swimming hole. Well, right up around, you go up this road, there's our family cemetery called Boat Cemetery. So we went we went there to look at where their dad was going to be buried, and they had taken some of my mom's ashes down because she was buried beside my dad here in Davenport, and they'd taken some down, her and my aunts, to be put between their parents, and I hadn't seen it yet. And um, so we went there, and we're sitting there, and Monty and I are sitting over on a picnic table, and my cousin Marty's kind of a tree-loving, hugging hippie. (laughs) And he's over going, well, look at this tree and all that, and it got quiet. So Monty and I look at each other because he's seen something, okay? Yeah. And um, we looked at each other and we said, Marty, it's time to go. It's time to go. And he's like, oh, you know, and he's over there and we're like, come on. So we just got weird and spooked about it. So we stood up and we went to the truck. And yeah. about that time, something jumped out of a tree, hit that ground. It literally rumbled the ground so hard that it almost knocked Marty off his feet. Here he come running and jumped in the truck with us and said, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. So I don't know, but I know one thing that wasn't a raccoon or anything else. And so I'm telling you, I just don't even know. um, I sometimes feel like I'm being followed when I'm down there. When it goes quiet, what are you hearing before it goes quiet? When you're down in there, you got all sorts of things that are being going yeah. on, and it, and like that night, and like the night with my when I was young, when it's when it's getting dusk, you're hearing whoop woo, and you're hearing, you oh. know, you're hearing things in the forest, and there's nothing. It goes quiet. Yeah, yeah. And it's like what? Sister Sharon and I, when the fir- before the first time I seen it, we commented. What is that? That's weird. And Shep the dog was literally like trying to walk in between our legs. It was just a really strange how yeah. that all went down. But oh, animals are very perceptive for that. Horses, yeah. dogs, cats. Well, the horses were and, stomping their feet. Know. They had their ears laid back, mm-hmm. and we just mm-hmm. assume mm-hmm. we're city kids. They don't. They don't want us here. Jim was so gentle. I just he was just never like that. But yeah. it was just so you do. You're not thinking you're gonna have something no. you're not going to see no something like this. no you're just seeing the reaction you think it's something else or i think it's you or something so yeah well thank you sheila i really appreciate thank the, you chris your, your story and uh, if you have any more information or that article or anything um i'll take a look at it though on the uh, miller county museum historical society thank <laughs> you so so very much i appreciate it i feel like something's been lifted off my shoulders so oh, thank you good. that's good to hear all right sheila yeah. Once okay. You, all right. Good. Good talking to you. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you Chris. Very much. Okay, all right. Bye bye. All right. It is time to make some dinner. I'm going to be making the base camp burger. This is really tasty, and we're going to have a beer with that as well. And before I do that, we're going to get a campfire going, make it nice and cozy. And uh, we got some kids playing wiffle ball over here. There's a lot of screaming and stuff. <laughs> I like kids, but the, the screaming. <laughs> Okay, so I got a new Milwaukee 16-inch splitting axe. That is 26 ounces, and that is going to take care of some business here. Isn't that awesome? That's a nice, it's heavy. 26-ouncer. So this is how real mountain men get their firewood from a mini mart. Doesn't that make sense? Uh, it works for me. There we go. Burn that.
Yeah, that Milwaukee works very nice. It's not too big, easy to pack, and uh, I think it was like 35 bucks. Works really well for what I'm doing though, just a little one night camping trip, and I'm not splitting a cord of wood or something. But yeah, I can do it one hand, two hands. The pine splits nice and easy, so. Okay, so this is Buffalo Burger. No antibiotics. And that is how we're going to start out with the burger there. And then I'm going to prep the condiments, which is lettuce, onion, tomato, pickle, and Pyrenees sauce. This is a tangy, tangy, fiery mayo. It's very hot. A little seasoned salt here. Just adds a little nice flavoring. We've got some avocado spray. Okay, so I'd like to start off Nice tomatoes. Ramen tomatoes work great because they're just a little bit smaller. I like the smaller slice like that. Lettuce. Love the dill chips. This is the, makes a difference. Gotta have a pickle on there, so you can make this work. Just a nice little pull like that. And like that. Potato buns. These work great. Taste great, too. Double tomato, double pickle. Triple pickle. Is that legal? I don't know if that's even legal. Triple pickle, triple pickle, double tomato, single onion. There we go. Just a little shot at the top there, that's it. That is the Buffalo Burger Base Camp Buffalo Burger. There we go. And for tonight's beer, we have from Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, the Leinen Kogels Summer Shandy. That is a Weiss beer with natural lemon lemonade flavors. And that is really a tasty beer. That's kind of like kicking off the summer season. Little 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 early here, but uh, that's what I'm doing. And that is an awesome little beer, so let's try it out. Let's taste it. I've had this before. Oh, it's very lemonade-y looking. <laughs> yeah, Lining Kugels, Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. That's uh, not too far from where I grew up in from Minnesota. You just kind of head straight east from where I used to live, so. Well, right away, there's obviously a lemonade taste, very smooth, 
It's a fruit beverage, is what they consider it. And it won awards years ago and really put it on the map at a, a brew fest. And uh, yeah, real tasty, real tasty beer. Cheers. Boy, that fire feels so good. Oh my gosh. It's not cold yet, but the temp is dropping pretty quickly. <laughs> I think I outdid myself with two burgers. I gotta sit kind of funny here to eat these, otherwise they flip into the fire. <laughs> Wow, that's a big one. Mm. That is a really good burger. Yeah, buffalo burger. Real lean. Real tasty. But really a pretty wild story from Sheila about her encounter in 1970 at 11 years old. That's, that's a lot to deal with when you're an 11 year old kid. That can affect you in different ways throughout your life. Kind of sets you up because you just don't know what you're dealing with. There was another story I heard about a little boy was on a field trip and they were in some state park not sure if it was Pennsylvania and there was adults teachers and kids and they're going through the forest and he was the last one this was in the 70s as well and there was no parents in the back of the line to watch all the kids in front of them and he got distracted by a turtle that he saw just off the trail. And he thought, wow, this is really cool. There's a turtle. And he picked it up and he was looking at it and he was checking it out and he looked for some more. And then he realized the group was long gone. It'd been three, four minutes. And he just got distracted like any little kid would do. And he's sitting there puts the turtle down he's looking around and he realizes how absolutely quiet it is and he's not really sure which direction to go I mean, he's they're on a trail but he went off the trail a little bit and he just felt afraid because he was by himself late afternoon in the forest the group is long gone and he hears something in the forest coming towards him and he doesn't know what to do so he just stands there and out of the forest steps this kind of a reddish tinged hairy hairy man Bigfoot steps out of the forest and he just casually walks up to this little boy I believe he was eight And he's about three or four feet away, standing directly in front of him. The little boy is just in a state of shock. Parents are gone. Everyone's gone. And this thing looks down at him. And then it reaches down and picks him up. And holds him at eye level for a seven, eight foot tall Sasquatch. looks at him kind of studies him turns his head back and forth the kid is having an out-of-body experience he's watching this in his mind somehow removed from from the situation like like a like a drone hovering right over here watching this and he felt calm this state of calmness come over him as this was happening and he sees this the massive arms in this Sasquatch holding him up surreal is the word and then after it was a long time couple of minutes 
This thing is like studying him, checking him out. It sets him down and it turns and it goes into the forest. And the kid didn't remember anything. He just remembered the next thing he remembered was there was an adult carrying him back to the bus. And the other teachers, the parents were all going, where were you? Did you run away? What's going on? And then the kids kind of picked on him. They were teasing him. And uh, speaking of kids, there's some kids walking behind me. <laughs> and he was just in a state of shock. He just thought there was nobody here to help me. There's nobody. I have nobody. Nobody's listening to me. And they asked him what happened. And he, he, he couldn't put into words what had happened to, to him. It was incomprehensible. And so this experience, and the adults not hearing him and understanding him and giving him a little grace, a little understanding, like, hey, he got, he got lost. He got distracted. He's a kid. You never know what's going to happen, right? And this affected him for the rest of his life. So I'm talking about... Uh, in relation to Sheila, who was 11 years old, so there's the kid walking. <laughs> they hear me talking to the camera, so Mr. Tripod, right? But uh, I'm loving this fire, and uh, anyways, this thing affected him uh, for the rest of his life, and he wasn't believed, and then he got people to later to hear him and understand him and listen to him. And that's what I try to do when I do my videos and, and stuff. I try to uh, just listen to people and just go, you know what? I didn't have the experience. I did not have the experience. You did. Why don't you tell us what happened to you? And we don't need to tell you what you experienced, what had happened to you, and tell you what had happened to you. You just tell us what your experience was and we'll just listen. That's all we have to do is listen. And if you're lying to us and making a big prank out of it, well, that's on you. That's on, you know, people that would do that. And I have never in two years experienced anything like that. Where people were making stuff up and lying and trying to trick me and prank me or something. Everything I've heard is, to me, very believable and to many of you as well. And Sheila is just another example of that, as far as I'm concerned. And that's why I do this and, and other things. I want to do other stories and other things, but this is what I'm doing right now. And uh, you guys seem to like this. I kind of like this. It's very fascinating to know that uh, there's the possibility that something like that is out here. All right, well, I better finish my... Uh, Jeez, I got, I got too much food here. <laughs> I'm going to finish this and, uh, and just, I'm just going to hang out. It's gonna, the sun's dropping really fast. Absolutely beautiful day today. I love it. Love the weather we're having. Sierra, Sierra Nevadas are amazing. All right, you guys, it's been a really good day. Really enjoyed this. It's just, everything's so familiar. It's like summer's coming, like I said, and just uh, camping and fire and cooking and hiking and, and uh, the mountains. Love the mountains. So I am gonna be turning in. I am not gonna get the stove going. I don't really need to. Uh, it's ready to go though. I know how to use it now, so it's great. Oh, oh. All right. 
morning. Oh, it's cool. it's cool this morning. It's not freezing, but it's cool. Wow, the bag worked really well. Really a warm bag. The Kelty Cosmic Down Zero Zero worked really well. Oh. Oh. All right, I'm gonna get some coffee going. It'll be really nice, warm me up. And the kids were up pretty late last night, running around, <laughs> screaming and stuff. <gasps> I had to go out there at one point and ask them, I'm sleeping here, please. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> they just kept it up. <laughs> the creek really helped me sleep though. It's really loud this time of year because of the uh, snow runoff. It's pretty awesome, so. All right, coffee time. All right, that is Hollis Street Coffee. That's an espresso. <laughs> that was our French roast. That is all right though. All right, best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. Well, if that's the best part of your day, I guess it's all downhill from there. Yikes. Oh yeah. New Folgers is terrific. Sure, Folgers is mountain grown. The richest kind of coffee. Folgers is a big favorite in most of the country. Mmm, it tastes terrific. <laughs> get new Folgers in the red can. Or for automatic drip coffee makers, get Folgers flaked coffee. Both delicious mountain grown Folgers. All right, thanks you guys for watching. And if you guys like stories about the strange, unexplained, and things that go bump in the night, please like and subscribe. You guys always know how to do that. And appreciate your comments, as always. And if you have your own story, I'd love to take a look at it. I can't put everything on the channel, but I do read everything I get. And that's BasecampChris2 at gmail.com. So, all right, we'll see you in the next one. Keep hiking.